something I have written. <laughs> I know. Well, I'm gonna cut it out before there's too much copyright infringement. <laughs> 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 Alright, hey everyone, Troy here. Hope you're doing well. Um, I am in Seattle for the week on vacation and I am visiting my best friend Scott who just so happens to be a film composer so I thought it would be a great opportunity to ask him a few questions um, about the process and kind of share some of that knowledge with you guys. Um, so yeah, here is Scott Stedman. He's an extremely talented uh, composer and yeah, so I guess first question would be um, where did you go to school? How did you get to the point you are now? Like where, what was your, I guess, what was the origin of Scott Stedman? Okay, so, wow, that's a long story. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, cool, so my name is Scott Stedman, for what it's worth. Uh, film composer based here in Seattle. I used to live in LA with Troy. Um, was my computer, sorry. Okay. Um, went to Chapman University for music, got my degree in music composition, and then uh, moved up here quickly soon after I finished school because LA is absurdly expensive and I can't afford to live there. And uh, basically what I do is I work with directors on independent films and mostly documentaries as well, um, writing music for them. And so I get contacted by those directors and uh, people who are working on you know their projects pretty much when they after they've finished filming, uh, after they've finished uh, like the first rough edit of a film, and I'm just hearing them in the background the entire time. Our friends are here as well, and so you might hear some dogs barking, some people moving around, uh, but don't worry about that. I think it shouldn't be too bad. As a film composer, you can work remotely. Um, you know, you don't have to necessarily be in LA or any like film hubs because yeah, you can work afterwards. And Definitely. Stuff. Yeah, and I, uh, you know, when there's recording sessions or stuff like that that I have to set up, I usually Skype in or. Um, you know, if it necessitates, I fly down back to California because all the musicians that I know are uh, they're in California. All the people I met from Chapman. So, yeah. um, so I guess, I guess what I really want to talk about is the process of um, scoring a film. Um, so why don't we start with kind of what is the beginning to the end? Like, what do you do from the inception of the idea when a director or filmmaker approaches you? Um, to the finished product, like, what is that process? Right. Like? So the first thing that we do. Um, you know, we sign a contract, say this is what the terms are, this is what I'm getting paid for it, and then as soon as that's, you know, I, before any of that even happens, uh, the director tells me a little bit about the film, and says this is what it's like, and I can tell him right off the bat if it's a project that I'd work on, mm. or not, you know, comedy, most, in most <laughs> cases, yeah, I mean, not that, that type of project. That's, I mean, anyone that's created, um, you kind of, in the beginning, you're like, this is my cup of tea or not, and so it's right, good that yeah. you can determine that. And I actually had a project really recently that I had to turn down because of that. Um, like a couple of days ago, I had oh, wow. I had this uh, had a person send me an email, and then sent me like a a sample track that they had on YouTube that they mm -hmm. wanted me to kind of like, uh, like hit the okay. hit the uh, hit the similar like vibe up. right? And it was like a screamo metal thing. Oh, and okay. I was, <laughs> I'm like, Definitely not. I don't write that. <laughs> Scott's very classically trained, so piano yeah. and you know. Yeah, orchestral instruments, or um, symphonies and things. So electronic stuff sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um, once I've determined that I'm the right composer for the job. Uh, the first thing that we do is we sit down and we spot the film, which means we look at their rough cut at that point. We look at what they have up to that point, what they've shot, and what their editors put together. And we kind of say, here's the type of music that you need for the film. We agree on something. We agree on, you know, this is definitely dramatic music should be kind of the overarching theme here. Or, you know, happy music or sad music. Or you kind of just get those basic emotions okay. tagged down. Um, and then you spot the film, which... Uh, you go through it and you say, this is where music needs to be and where it doesn't need to be. And sometimes you disagree on that. There's sometimes one like of the... You, you have to go to bat for one of the... Yeah, know, because I, kind of, I find that one of the things that I disagree with most on, disagree most on with, uh, with some directors is where they think music needs to be and where it doesn't need to be. Mm. And I usually err on the side of like, this part doesn't need music and like this scene would be so much more powerful with no music in it, uh, but, so but sometimes, you know, like... They want wall-to-wall -wall music versus... Yeah, silence. so directors can sometimes be, they're not, I don't know if they're, they're unsure of a scene, whether or not the scene is impactful and they want their movie to be good, right? Mm -hmm. So they think that they'll increase the impact of it with some music, okay. and sometimes doesn't need it. Okay, so I kind of, I guess, um, you, you already started to answer that, but that was going to be my next question was, um, 
how do you prefer to like uh, how do you prefer to work with directors and filmmakers um, and and what do you like to look for in a film director like what what is a good quality um, and what are some qualities that are just kind of get under your skin a little <laughs> bit I guess um, I'd say my biggest pet peeve is a director who's afraid to hurt my feelings okay um, because you know obviously it's a brainchild you know something that I've created is something that you know, I, I care about, right. but at the same time, this is something that I'm getting paid for. Right. And uh, if if a director can't tell me, no, this doesn't really work here, then you know the the business relation doesn't really work. Right. Because if if you're if you're unable to tell to to say like, you, know, you have to be able to tell to right. tell somebody you know this that this is not working, and I can say, hey, that's fine, I I can fix that, but right. I need to know to fix it. It's like it. It's a collaboration. I mean, yeah. myself as a director, the only re I mean, not the only reason, but I myself reach out to you because I know I personally cannot write this music. And so you have to take it upon yourself to respect the, you know, the talent that you brought on um, to do a certain job. But at the same time, you have to, you know, it's a collaboration at the end of the day. So I think it's good to have like that relationship of uh, yeah. an understanding. And, and, and that goes the opposite direction too when you have, uh, when you have a creative individual who's too lashed onto their ideas mm. and can't see it in a different light. And then right. that can kind of hinder the process too. Right. And then on the inverse of that, one of my favorite things is when you have, you know, you just have a relationship that works perfectly and you have a director that can tell you, this doesn't work there, you need to fix that. And mm. I can just go right back off and send away. And, and then um, people who can really pinpoint what they want mm. is awesome. Okay. Because, uh, you know, it just makes my job easier when I don't have to when I don't have to send five different revisions of the queue um, before before I hit the right note. If mm -hmm. you can say, well, you need to push more in the direction of you know the Inception soundtrack or something. Okay, like so that. you, that's what something else I was gonna ask. And for visuals, a lot of time, uh, a lot of cinematographers they like references. They like you know if you give them a visual reference or something like that, can be like, yes, I'll. I can copy this. Some musicians aren't, aren't music, some cinematographers aren't a fan of that. They like to just kind of deviate from everything else. Now, I guess that's what I was gonna ask as well is, do you like when you get references or do you like to kind of, I mean, obviously they go to you because yeah. of your style, but if they bring you a reference, do you appreciate that or is that something that you, that hinders? Sometimes, it depends yeah. on the project. Um, you know, if, if a director comes into the project right off the bat and they say, I want it to sound like this, mm -hmm. then, you know, so much better we can makes the whole process quicker. Streamlines it if we can hit right off the bat and just kind of copy without getting sued. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, a, that's a good thing. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll, alternatively, I think what I'm saying here, if uh, you know, if, if you if you have too many references or you have temp music that needs to be copied at yeah. that point, then it stops really being a creative process and it starts to kind of being a chore more than anything. Oh, okay. Um, you know, if someone says, if someone has, the, you know, the, the big thing lately is like temping every single edit with like Dark Knight, you know, like oh, the Dark Knight soundtrack. I yeah, I've seen so, that a lot. Yeah. It's <laughs> so, very intense and a lot of emotion. And so yeah, and so, uh, you know, you have everything temped with like the Dark Knight or something or some crazy wall-to-wall -wall Hans Zimmer music and, you know, I mean, I can't possibly compete with John Williams or Hans Zimmer or yeah, James Newton Howard or something. To expect you know, that would be naive though. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? It's not because of talent. I mean, obviously there's experience differences there, but I mean, most of the time those people are working with the Philharmonic, you know, or symphonies and things like that. And yeah. for the most part, we have some access to those things, but it would be naive to assume that necessarily. So. Yeah, the budget, a budget on a film, you know, the budget on Dark Knight or something like that for a, for an orchestra run into the millions easily. Oh, yeah. And uh, our budgets typically tend to be a lot less than that. So. Right. Um, so, oh yeah, that was another thing I was gonna ask is like, I more or less know a lot of your influences, but um, what are some of your biggest influences on your music? I mean, even outside of film composers, like what what are your biggest influences? Yeah. So, um, outside of like film composers, if I could talk about like a classical composer. Um, I brought this up to you a billion times, but there's a composer by the name of Sergei Rachmaninoff, who's a Russian composer, mm. who was uh, who was clinically depressed most of his most of his life. He was uh, not, he wasn't excommunicated. He was he had to flee his home country during the, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution, um, 
and it really showed through in a lot of his music. His music was just like wiltingly sad and mm. just melodic and beautiful, mm -hmm. and I try to capture that a lot in the stuff that I write. Not just write, you know, repetitive bars of the same stuff, mm -hmm. um, but have you know storytelling in music. Right. And he did a lot. That's of that. the key. I mean, it's all it's all about a story. Yeah. At the end of the day, so um, outside of Rachmaninoff, uh, you know. A lot of film composers, um, James Newton Howard, um, Henry Gregson Williams, uh, John Williams, everyone's got to throw that out there. Uh, Hans Zimmer too. Hans Zimmer for sure. Yeah. Hans Zimmer, everyone loves to hate on him and he does do a lot of like the, you know, the repetitive kind of stuff. But, but he changed the, right. the scape of, of scoring. Interstellar yeah. is one of my favorite scores of all time. Right. I mean, it was unbelievable. Um, yeah, I gotta think. Of, I can come back to that one. I gotta think okay. some more influence or something. One sec, I'm gonna make sure this still recording. Begin that 13 minute limit, though. Yeah, that was just <laughs> out there. Okay, and then let me. Was it like right there? It was at 12:10. Oh, pretty close. <laughs> Perfect. Um, cool. Um, okay, so what piece of advice or what you know what is some bit of knowledge that you have um, that you would like to share with others? Uh, As a film composer, I mean, or other film composers, not like in life, <laughs> just like yeah, no. for specifically for composing for other composers, uh, sure, yeah, or people that are trying to get into it. Uh, take every single project when you're starting out. Take every single project that you possibly can, um, even if you hate it. Uh, that'll get you outside your comfort zone and teach you how to do projects that you can't stand, um, like comedy for me. <laughs> uh, it's recurring. <laughs> um, yeah, and once you kind of get your foot in the door with your connections a little bit, then you can uh, then you can start to kind of pick and choose a little more with the projects that you take. Um, you know, if something doesn't work with your style at all, then you're you know, don't be afraid to tell somebody that you can't. You know, you can't do their film justice. Um, and then, I think one of the biggest things that I took from one of my mentors to heart um, when I was when I was in when I was at university, I interned for. Uh, fairly well-known film composer. And um, one of the things he told me was that he basically, he basically, he asked me, would you keep doing this if you were penniless and broke and it made you no money? And I said, absolutely yes. You know, this is this is what I need to do to, to feel fulfilled in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people who are musicians today want to be film composers just because they want, you know, a greater audience. They like the stuff. idea of it. Yeah, you like the idea of it, but then in reality, it kind of loses its luster when you you realize it's it's can be a pain in the ass a lot of times. A lot um, of creative, a lot of artistic yeah. <laughs> work is. I mean, you so you have to do a lot of grinding, but yeah. Yeah, but you know, do it because you love it, not because you want to make a million dollars doing it. Because doing anything for money is the wrong reason. Um, do you have any advice? Sorry, were you gonna? No. Okay. Do you have right. any advice for um, maybe like finding your style of music or your style of writing? Was there something um, that really helped you find your niche? Um, and like, because you do do a lot of do do. Sorry, uh, <laughs> a lot of like electronic symphonies and classical music. I mean, was that just through your classical training and, and the music you listen to, or was there? I mean, was that just what you like? I think it was a result of. So a lot, of, a lot of composers will, and myself absolutely included, is you imitate the crap out of the people that you, that you admire and respect. Um, a lot of my early work and probably a lot of my work still sounds a lot like Rachmaninoff or you know, a, a worse version of Rachmaninoff or because you, you can never aspire to be the people that you admire, right? Yeah. You, you cannot. Standing on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, you can, never, you can never match what, you know, Hans Zimmer did on, on Interstellar, or yeah. Harry Gregs Williams did on like Narnia or something like that. You know, right. films like that. Um, they just have really incredible scores. But the other the other aspect of that is as you learn to kind of develop your own voice, you'll find that you have an idea in your mind, and you can never quite match exactly what you want to get. Mm. And but that's okay because something else can come out of that. Right. The ultimate theme, the ultimate goal there being as you get better and better at your at your craft, that you just get closer and closer 
to matching what you hear in your head. Mm, um, okay, that's cool. So yeah, I mean, like my earliest step, I could even pull it up on the computer. Yeah, I uh, have. I'll I probably have, have to do a recording of it. <laughs> yeah. I have a uh, like my very very first projects. They're just absolutely awful. But the important thing there was that I heard something in my head and I know what I wanted to sound like. And I was frustrated because even though I worked these projects for hours and hours, I didn't really understand how to how to write well enough to to like encapsulate what I was hearing in my head. Right. And the more and more I've worked at it, the better I've gotten at I see. That's at interesting. Catch capturing that. Yeah. So. I mean it's the same ideas. I mean, we are actually both photographers as well. Um, it's kind of the same idea as taking a photo. I mean you have an idea in your head of what you're trying to capture, at least for me, like I'll, I'll go somewhere and be like, I have an idea in my head of what I want to capture, but over the years, I've personally just gotten so much better being like, I know exactly the settings I want, I know what I need to wait till at what time and things like that. And I'm sure that's yeah. kind of the same idea there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it can be frustrating, you know, you hear a, you want something to sound beautiful and you don't quite, a music school is really good for anybody looking for that as well. <laughs> um, I was awful at reading music and writing down my ideas before music school but the more you know I was taught the tools that I needed to do that appropriately um, and then even outside of school I you know I worked worked my ass off to to learn how to do that you did. to yep. <laughs> learn my projects and everything I uh, I wrote for my our, our uh, let me start the sense again um, for the bachelor of music composition thesis at Chapman we had to uh, write you know a large-scale work and it was kind of this like bare minimum requirement was that you had to have like a large chamber ensemble piece and most of my peers at that point were writing uh, you know just you know something to get by because they were all everyone's busy with their own projects of course and no disrespect to any of them but you, know, you just write a piece with ten instruments that you like and that follows the guidelines that the, the faculty would kind mm -hmm. of lay out for you. And I didn't really want to do that because I felt like that wasn't uh, progressing mm -hmm. my knowledge in film composing. Mm -hmm. So I wrote, you know, a, a 25 minute long piano concerto, learned the piano concerto, had a choir with it. We had 75 musicians on stage, you know, I just like, I took it. It's brilliant. <laughs> I took it like so much further than the, the, than the assignment required because I felt like that's what I needed to do to learn what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. what I wanted to learn, right? Mm -hmm. Not just to, not just to fulfill an assignment requirement. Mm -hmm. So cool. Yeah. Did I adequately answer it? Absolutely. Um, I guess a couple more questions. I want to know, and I'm sure everyone else wants to know, what are you working on right now? And this is, um, you know, anything. I know you, you're constantly working on something. Yeah. Um, like film, uh, yeah. this personal so project. I have, I have one film, on my plate right now, and it's a kind of a personal project for a friend that I'm helping out at school. Um, he was two years younger than me, so I think he's finishing up now, or he'll be he'll be graduating in. What what June. project is that? Uh, it's called I can't I don't think I can really talk about it. Okay. Really. No. Um, <laughs> um, I probably can, but yeah, I just yeah. won't. Um, so I've got that. That's the only project on my plate right now. Um, I've got two more three more documentaries coming up in March, and then, um, got one more, and then uh, another uh, independent film from a director that I met in, oh. Oh, good. Yeah, cool. And then another independent film from a director I met in the UK um, that will start, I'll start working on probably in March, I think they're doing principal photography in February. I did not know about that one. Yeah. That's awesome. So, uh, did you? War of the English Fox Hunters. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So okay. it's that same director. Oh, wow. Um, okay, cool. We got along really well on that project, and um, that whole thing was like flawless. That's like, awesome. From being to end, so we're working again in February. Fantastic. Um, that's on my plate. My biggest project that I work on right now is my one of my uh, my biggest like hobbies is to read uh, really long old books. Um, like I read Frankenstein, Frankenstein's Monster, um, read through Dracula. Uh, Jekyll and Hyde, which wasn't really thick, but still an old book. Um, and right now, most recently, I'm working on Moby Dick. Um, I was in Uganda in March of this year. Last, Last year. year. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Almost a year ago. Jesus. Yeah. 
uh, and I read all the way through Moby Dick when I was there, and just fell in love with the book. It's an unbelievable book, and you should definitely read it if you haven't. Um, and my favorite thing to do is to read those books and then write these really long, kind of like programmatic symphonies about them. Um, you should add a little annotation right there that says what programmatic means, because that's like a... Oh, okay, okay. Um, I'll tell yeah. you what it is. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so Moby Dick is uh, a symphony that I've been working on for almost, the, almost a year now. Oh my god, I need to finish it. Um, <laughs> And it's not a race though, right? It's no, of course this, not. This is, you want it to be. Right. Um, it's the longest I've worked on a project um, by far. Uh, I worked on Jekyll and Hyde for almost a year, but I'm okay. almost over a year at Moby Dick at this yeah. point. Uh, and, you know, at this point, it's, almost, it's over an hour long. It uh, follows the story pretty closely. I pick the chapters that I really like, and that's kind of my way to unwind mm -hmm. is to, you know, I'm always writing music, even if it's not for a project. Mm -hmm. And so, this one has just been one of them. That's actually what I have up here for visual purposes visual. on the screen. Well, maybe uh, you can play it right now. Um, it's probably going to peak on here, but I'll probably have a recording that I can play, you know, uh, a little bit of it so you can hear it in all its glory. Uh, <laughs> but I know eventually Scott is probably going to be posting. I mean, he has a website and all that, which we'll get to in a bit. Um, but um, you'll be able to definitely hear it there. But anyways. Help yeah, um, I'll play just kind of like this main theme section. I'll turn this down so it's not going to blast your speakers off. Um, and what is this program, by the way, so people... This is FL Studio. Okay. Um, two main, or three main programs I use most often are FL Studio for quick writing, uh, Reason, propeller head Reason for um, wiring instruments into that. Reason has an amazing sound bank. Um, and you use like real instruments when you're writing? Or these, you mean they're like plug-in downloads of the instruments? They're downloads of the instruments, right. Okay. And then um, Sibelius is a program for notation software. Mm -hmm. So you use Sibelius to notate all of this and then send it off to like session musicians okay. um, to have it actually like live recorded if oh, the budget yeah. affords. Yeah, yeah. Um, which usually doesn't. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and then sometimes Cubase as well to write, which is a different program altogether. Um, but yeah, that's what this is all. taking the time to yeah. talk with us about all this. Um, where can people find your work? Yeah, uh, so I have two websites. Um, two. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a portfolio website and then a, yeah, portfolio website is probably all that matters. Um, Scott, my middle name is Quentin, so it's Scott, Q-E-N-T dot I-N. Um, Q-U. Q-U-E-N-T dot I-N, yeah. Um, and yeah, you can find scores that I've written in the past. They're all available for free download. I don't really, not really interested in making any money off of them after I've gotten paid initially for them. So you're welcome to download any of them, take a listen. Uh, yeah, slash music on that. So cool. And it's all. I mean, I'm very biased, of course, but um, it's all phenomenal music. It would be a great place for you to go if you're an inspiring musician to kind of check out some music, see what someone that's in the industry is doing. Um, and also if you're interested in photography, Scott is a great photographer. He's one of my biggest inspirations for photography. Um, again, and thank you. Um, if you want to see my work, uh, if you're a subscriber, I'm sure you don't know this, but it's troynicolok.com, uh, troynicolok on Instagram and all that stuff as well. So thank you so much. And, uh, we're going to do this handshake thing. <laughs> all right. Cool. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Perfecto!